Okay, we're uh, coming now to the end of our journey in many particle quantum mechanics. And we've reached the last topic of this course, which is a short overview of symmetries in many body quantum systems or in quantum systems. And the objective for this last part is to prove a theorem, a theorem known as Wigner's theorem, which tells us how symmetries are implemented in quantum mechanics, partially. This theorem is still under active research, I think it's fair to say, in the context of more general theory. Now, just a quick word on symmetries. Why do we care about symmetries? Well, there's two main reasons that we, we want to study symmetries in physics. So the first reason is that it's cuts down the search space of things we have to look at. So if, if the theory that we care about is known to have some symmetry on the basis of experimental observations, we do an experiment many times, we see that some symmetry is never violated, then therefore we conclude that that symmetry is a symmetry of nature, then it's easier for us to discover new theories because there are fewer theories to look at. You know, either you have the space of all physical theories or you have the space of physical theories which obey this particular symmetry. So knowing symmetries, the more symmetries you know, the easier your job is in discovering physical theories. That's, that's just a simple counting argument, right? And the second reason why symmetries are useful, suppose we know our physical theory, and suppose we know that it has a particular symmetry, then how could having a symmetry be a useful thing? Well, again, it cuts down the search space for us. If we know that our solution, our theory has a symmetry, then we know that the solution to the Schrodinger equation will have to have that symmetry. And then we don't have to look at, at, at as big a vector space of solutions in order to find the correct one. So symmetries are useful in those two ways. If you promote symmetries to being fundamental symmetries of nature, then it also helps the human mind to discover new theories as well. Well, what we're going to do in this last part of the course is introduce symmetry transformations in quantum mechanics. What do they mean operationally? And then we're going to conclude from that that these symmetries have to be represented by unitaries or anti-unitary operations. That's the content of Wigner's theorem. So before I state Wigner's theorem, let's write down a definition. The reason why I say that this is still under active research is that this particular definition isn't the most general one you could write down. But it's the one that we're going to use for this course. In quantum mechanics, a symmetry transformation T is a transformation of rays in Hilbert space. Okay, it's not only a transformation of rays which preserves, uh, not only a ray transform, it's also one that preserves transition probabilities. And what that means in the present context is that for all states psi 1 in some ray, and I'll define this notation in one second, and for all states psi 2 in some other ray, then the transition probability between psi 1 and psi 2 oops, I forgot to write down the transformed states
right? That's what a, ray, a symmetry transformation is. It's a transformation of rays. What are rays? So remember, in quantum mechanics, states are not are defined up to a global phase. That means that states are equivalence classes of vectors in Hilbert space. Equivalence classes of vectors where the vector z times phi and z prime times phi are exactly the same thing, where z mod squared is 1 and z is a complex number. That's what a ray is. So a symmetry transformation obviously takes states to states. Right? You, before you do the symmetry, the system's in a state. After you do the symmetry transformation, the system's in a state. So it's got to be at least a transformation of rays. And it has the property that preserves transition probabilities, which means that no matter what state, no, ma no matter what pair of states you have in some ray, or no matter what pair of states you have, let's call them ray phi 1 and ray phi 2, then any element in this equivalence class and any element in this equivalence class has to get transformed to another pair of elements, psi 1 prime and psi 2 prime, such that this transition probabilities are preserved. That's what it means, symmetry transformation in this course. Now, that's not the most general meaning that you could take. The most general way to do this is to recognize that the states of quantum mechanics are positive linear functionals on things called operator spaces. And then you have to re-approach this definition and redefine what we mean by transition probabilities. That's not something we have time to do in this course. And in fact, there's still people are still writing papers about this. So this is current research. But this, this is settled. This is one interpretation of the word symmetry transformation that I, I think we could safely say that's an accepted definition. It noticed that it, the word linear doesn't appear anywhere there. So, so far, a symmetry transformation is just something that's a transformation of rays. It could be horrendously nonlinear, according to this definition. Nowhere is the word linear mentioned. That's crucial. In fact, it turns out that symmetry transformations need not be linear, which is, I think, sort of sufficiently surprising. But not anything, not anything goes, okay? So there are some, some transformations can be symmetry transformations, other ones must, are not allowed to be. So Wigner was the first one to consider this problem, and he came up with a characterization. So any symmetry transformation in the sense above represented on Hilbert space as an operator, which is already something. And furthermore, this operator is not just any, any operator. It's either unitary or and crucially, anti-unitary. So this is a word you may not have met but so far in, this in your studies. I'm going to tell you what an anti-unitary operator is as we go th when we go through this proof. So this is an absolutely foundational result. Good question. They are both linear, yes. So we also learn. Uh, no, no, no. Anti-unitaries are anti-linear. Yeah. So not all operators are linear operators. They can be anti-linear. So I'll define what that means in uh, the process of going through this proof of the uh, of this of this statement. So I guess we won't make it through all the proof today. 
but it is we are going to do every step of it. It's sufficiently novel. This pro it, it's sufficiently elementary and sufficiently novel that it's worth going through every step of this proof. So probably it takes two lectures. And so much depends on this, this result that it's worth doing it. Now you might wonder, anti-unitary, I haven't met that before, what on earth can this be? Why would we even care? Well, it turns out some symmetries of our, our theories uh, appear to be anti-unitary. So there's one symmetry that I can quote already to you as being anti-unitary, and that's time reversal. So any system that is invariant under time reversal symmetry, is, it will turn out to be invariant under an anti-unitary symmetry, because that's what time reversal is. We won't, probably won't talk too much about time reversal, but just know that there are certain symmetries of our theories which we think, we, we think these symmetries are there, we haven't seen them broken yet, and they have to be implemented with anti-unitary operators. Well, it's very hard to get started on a proof like this because you have to, like, you, you don't even know that T is, a, is, is an operator. So we're going to have to somehow get that T is an operator from this proof. So we have to build up from the very, very bare, bare pieces of what we know. Now we're going to have a separate, our Hilbert space is separable. I didn't say that here, but. I mean, you can pretty much assume in this course that we have a complete orthonormal basis. Proof begins like most arguments in quantum mechanics. Let's consider an orthonormal set of state vectors. I'll just name them here, psi j. Step one, get a basis. Then, That's pretty much the only distinguished set of vectors we have to play with. So we may as well apply our symmetry transformation to these rays. There's not much else we can do.
all we can do is apply our symmetry transformation t to this each of these rays. So that should be a k, a j. We've applied our symmetry transformation to this ray. We've got another ray here, which we call T of phi of J. And that's an equivalence class of vectors. Let's just take an arbitrary vector out of that ray. Well, we already have some information. We know that transition probabilities are preserved, so we can use that information. to infer that this set of vectors here uh, well, while not being directly orthonormal, they're almost orthonormal, yeah? There's a, they're at least orthogonal to each other when they're orthogonal, right? These are zero when these are zero. And when they're the same, then they have the same uh, amplitude, uh, probability squared. Length is the right word for that. But that's actually quite a lot of information because, because that's actually always positive. then we actually, de de uh, actually conclude that these vectors form an orthonormal basis, which is pretty neat. Uh, yeah, I said that too quickly. Do they form an orthonormal basis? Well, how could things go wrong? Let's have a look. Well, they're definitely a set of vectors that are ortho orthogonal to each other when they're different, and they have length one. Does that make it a complete set, a complete orthonormal basis? Yeah. It might be that there are bases of a subspace. We have to get rid of that possibility now. We have to deal with the fact that our symmetry transformation uh, doesn't push us onto a subspace. That's, that's, that's a real concern. Suppose it's not complete, the set. Well, that means there's a vector orthogonal to them. Now I'm going to. I didn't say this actually in the definition of the symmetry transformation. So I'm going to have to re change the, the statement of the theorem. Because indeed, without that one crucial word, it could be that we end up on a subspace. any invertible symmetry transformation can be represented. Now, we, you, you, you've probably been alerted to the, this possibility of landing on a subspace from the scattering theory discussion we had in the previous part of these lectures, where indeed these Muller operators take you to a subspace and they preserve all probabilities. So this, this word here is crucial for this theorem to work.
And then the way we're going to get this result is we just apply the inverse transformation, which is guaranteed to be there. somewhere because we know that that transition probability we can compute it from the definition of symmetry transformation that's the same as this one but that's zero which is a contradiction because this here is an or complete set, a complete orthonormal set of vectors, and that's a vector that's somehow orthogonal to all of them. So indeed, we do get a complete orthonormal set of vectors after applying our symmetry transformation T. So the next step of this proof is to build a thing called a phase reference. So the problem is T, if we'd have a linear combination of these vectors here, T might do funny things to the phases of these vectors, psi j. And we're going to have to build up information about how T acts on superpositions. So without loss of generality, We're going to fix on one of our basis vectors. Let's call it psi 1. And we're going to build a new state. So we're really trying to understand how does T act on superpositions. Because that's really the only difficult part of this theorem. You know, it's, we've already got a nice basis after the transformation. Does this operator take linear combinations in a nice way to linear combinations? So to do that, we're going to build a, test, a, a bunch of test states, call them psi which are just defined to be equal superpositions of our state psi 1 and another basis vector. And of course, these are all elements of some ray. Let's call that ray omega j. And j is not allowed to be equal to 1. So how, now the question is, how does t act on this ray? So this is a ray defined by psi j. I mean, actually, I could just write psi j here. How does T act on that? Does it wreck the superposition? Maybe. Let's find out. So we know we have a basis, we have a transform vector, a sequence of transform vectors. Let's expand them in terms of this new basis. Let's see what happens.
we know that Xi j, this representative of this transform ray, is a linear combination of these these guys here has to be. The only question is, what are the CJKs? I mean, if it's linear, then you know what they are, right? But we don't know that this thing is linear. But we know something, right? So from star, this is the only tool at our disposal, we know that cjj squared, well, I'll leave the square there, equals cj1 equals 1 over root 2. And then I'll take the square away. That's safe. We know this because the transition probability between psi j prime and psi 1 prime, we know that. That's, that, that, that's really given to us from the only piece of data we know about symmetry transformations, which is that they preserve transition probabilities. So we know that the absolute value of these two numbers is 1 over root 2, and the rest is 0. Awesome. So we actually pretty close to linear, is linear up to doing some crazy thing to the phase on these Cs. But we still got so much freedom at, at our disposal at the moment that we can cancel off that kind of craziness. You get this one-time choice of phases. You get to choose a phase for psi j prime. You get to choose a phase for psi, psi j prime. But then you've done it, right? You've spent that phase. And well, what's going to happen? Maybe we're going to run into trouble by choosing these phases later on when we look at more complicated superpositions. But for this one time now, we, we can do that. And we can set these numbers exactly. We're going to, well, we know that we're going to get operators in the end, be they linear, linear or antilinear. So we're going to start using, building a notation that allows us to do, do this. So we're going to introduce something that looks like an operator. We're going to call it u. And I've got two different notations for exactly the same thing. We're going to put the u outside the ket and the u inside the ket. These are meant to be the same thing. Now this notation is only allowed to be applied to these two vectors, no other vectors for the moment. Let's see if there's any, if this notation works. Well, this is just expanding out what Xi is, Xi J is. So at least up to this notation, this thing, it looks like we have an operator u at our, that's implementing this transformation. 
at least for vectors of this very special form, psi 1 plus psi j, and psi 1 and psi j. Yeah, that works so very well. Let's try and do it on a complete, on the arbitrary superposition. Okay, let's just do it on an arbitrary vector now. See what happens. Step one is to use the data we have at hand, which is that we have a complete orthonormal set of vectors, psi j. Let's use that fact. And expand like that. The next step is to apply t, the only other thing we can do. and expand in terms of our basis set. That's that information used up. Then the only other bit of information we have at our disposal is these transition probabilities are conserved. Let's use that information. There we go, we just used that. We learn that cj squared has got to be equal to cj prime squared, mod squared. So what does this tell us? This tells us that however the symmetry acts, it acts by preserving these probabilities, but it might do something crazy to the phases of these cj's. And the only ones we know that are protected so far are vectors of the form equal superposition of psi 1 and psi j. They're the only ones whose phases are not crazy. And why are they not crazy? Because we just chose the phases so they're not crazy. We've got to see if that choice doesn't make the other crazy things happen later on. So let's 
that's uh, write down that data. Now, oops, I put a mark on the wrong thing here. Let's call this equation I and this equation II here. So the fact that we know what happens to psi j and we know what happens to our superpositions, well, that allows us to conclude this consequence here. And this is what the, the trick that you, this is pretty much the only serious part of the proof that isn't completely just exploiting the data that you can at this point. You know, most pr a proof like this, you have so few assumptions that you can only put the assumptions together in a handful of ways and the proof just works by using that, those handful of ways. But sometimes a proof needs something a bit clever and this is the bit where it's a bit clever. You have to know to, to build the superposition state psi j and psi j and then exploit this transition probability thing statement like that. There's another trick that comes a little bit later, but it's the same idea. So if you look at this thing here, it's kind of like a parallelogram law. And in fact, this equation one and two is pretty restrictive indeed, as we'll see, if you put them together. So if you take the ratio take equation 2, divide it by equation 1, then we're going to learn something interesting. It tells us that the real part is an exercise, very, very simple exercise. The real part of C1 divided by Cj is equal to the real part of C1 prime divided by Cj prime. And also, the imaginary part. Ah, but not just anything. This is where it gets very interesting indeed. If you go through this derivation here very carefully, you see that the imaginary part of Cj divided by C1 can be plus or minus the imaginary part of Cj prime divided by C1 prime. Okay. There are two, two possible results from this, this, this derivation here. So we're going to give them names. Therefore, Cj divided by C1 equals Cj prime divided by C1 prime. Let's call that possibility I, but there's another possibility that we can't immediately throw out, and that is that the ratio of these two quantities is equal to the complex conjugate. And this is it, right? You know, from this point onwards, we have this is characteristic of a unitary transformation, but this, this over here is characteristic of something called an anti-unitary transformation. We'll get to that. So we're, almost, we're kind of almost done, except, and in fact, I think if you look in Wigner's original argument, 
Uh, it was a quick step from here to the answer. However, there's a subtlety. And we have to take account of this subtlety, and this is, this requires a bit more work. This, the way U acts on CJ, it either takes, basically it either takes CJ to CJ prime star or CJ prime without the star. Now nothing forbids U doing uh, no stars on a couple of the CJs and then on, a, on the other CJs complex conjugating them. You know, it, it doesn't have to do the same thing for every CJ, right? There's no rule so far that says for all CJ we have to either do this or for all CJ we have to do this, this, this uh, transformation there. So we're going to have to prove that once, you've, once your unitary is acting like this on one of the coefficients or a couple of the coefficients that all the rest must behave like case I or all the rest must behave like case II. That requires a little bit more work, but it's going to use the same trick. suppose this phenomenon has occurred. We found a symmetry transformation where it complex conjugates one of the coefficients but not the other. To make that non-trivial, we need that CJ and CK are complex non-trivial numbers so that they're different after complex conjugating. Then we're going to use exactly the same argument. We're going to build a superposition of the, the, the three characters now. Take an equal superposition of psi 1, our phase reference state, psi j, the guy that doesn't get complex conjugated, and psi k the guy that gets complex conjugated, and we're going to see that we will arrive at a contradiction unless we either both do this or both do complex conjugating. I notice I forgot some primes here. Or did I? No? Yeah, I, I forgot some primes. Right? Now notice that the coefficients here are all real numbers. So already this information up here tells us how the transformed vector will look. It's going to have to look like this. And this additional phi, uh, alpha, sorry, has to equal one.
and we argue just the same as we did before. So you look at transition probabilities and then you take some ratios and then you will conclude, so we know that this thing here always equals this thing here. And we'll make this an exercise because it's the same steps as what we used up here, but I think it's worth thinking through slowly. This exercise forces you to conclude that the product of the imaginary parts of these two coefficients is zero if they have a differing behavior under the action of u. And there's our contradiction. So either one or two must hold for all pairs j and k. That's where the contradiction lies. Okay, we're basically done. We've uh, we're not quite done. We're almost almost done showing that this phase choice. Can be extended to general superposition, so the proof isn't over yet. So I better clarify. So indeed there's a contradiction, but we need to extend this trick to arbitrary superpositions. We can already see what you how you is going to act.
we're almost done, but we're not, because on one superposition we could be making choice A, but then if we put in a different state with a different superposition, then you might suddenly act like this. We still haven't excluded that possibility. So there's nothing, it, you, the action of you could discontinuously decide to act like this or this. We have to exclude that now. So suppose we find a pair where that happens. Suppose we find this pair where u acts like possibility a on one of the vectors and like possibility b on the second. Then we might hope we can derive some kind of contradiction there. The answer is not quite, not quite. And the reason, well, we'll see the reason. What do we know? Well, we know these transition probabilities between these two have to be preserved under the transformation. And this is possibility A, right? And possibility B, all together at the same time. Because this guy acts like no complex conjugation, then we're fine. But this B one, when U acts on this, then the Bs get complex conjugated. That's why we don't have a star here. And what does this imply? Well, if you write it all out, it implies that the product of these imaginary components, this is a teeny exercise, Just write out the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and take imaginary parts. It's that simple. For j is not equal to k, I think. No, that's just how it is. So this is almost enough. Not quite. To get a contradiction, we need to find a third vector, a third comp state vector. And it turns out there always is one. Because this is pretty easy to satisfy, actually, you put some pair of vectors. I mean, they just might be orthogonal. That was easy. They might be real orthogonal. So that's kind of, we haven't really got a contradiction yet. But if you rerun the argument for this third vector that's transforming however you like, or one of the two ways, that's when you arrive at the contradiction. Let's call this plus and and, not or in this case.
So plus here implies that you have to make the same choice of, of action between A and this third vector, the first and the third, and this implies that you better make the same choice on the second and the third. And then that's it, we're done. And that is basically the proof of Wigner's theorem. Although we should at least explain the notation anti-unitary. So we know that we have to consistently use choice A or B across the whole of Hilbert space. Let's see what B means. and take two vectors, and let's justify the, the the terminology anti-unitary. So let's, I'm gonna just, with this last step, we're going to make choice B. So if you apply choice B to the this superposition here, let's see how you, the U now so defined acts. Well, you put in the superpositions. And you expand out what we know. And you are very careful with complex conjugates. And you use B again. Then you see that for all all superpositions, U acts in this way. So U acts basically linearly, but whenever U passes by a complex number alpha, it complex conjugates it. So that's what we mean by antilinear. Or in fact.
It's also unitary, as you can tell, just by looking at the, by using the fact that transition probabilities are conserved. Right, it's anti-unitary would mean that that's equal to psi psi. Well, right, you can just check that. Oops. That. That's anti-unitariness there. And that's, I think, where we'll stop the proof because the unit, the case A, where we don't get complex conjugation, that's the, the proof argument is identical. So we did it. We went from knowing that a symmetry transformation takes rays to rays, and without knowing anything else, apart from the fact that transition probabilities are conserved, and that this transformation was assumed invertible, we've learned that that transformation must be represented on Hilbert space as either an anti-linear and anti-unitary operator, or as a linear unitary operator. So it's a quite a fantastic way to pull yourself up by the bootstraps into knowing a lot more about your operator. So I think that's a convenient moment to stop, and I thank you all very much for your attention.